All right. Yeah. Um, thank you. This is Jerry and Joy talking about the big fungus. Um, Jerry and Joy. <laughs> there we go. Um, where do you want? Do you want to start first? Do you have sure. any reflections on 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 what this what what did this bring up for you? Is is I think a question I'm really interested in. Mm, okay, so the big fungus. When I first hear the name, I think about something kind of funny and funky. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, uh, it's the big fungus. Everyone is coming together. Um, and then you mentioned the inspiration is uh, related to the mycelia, like the root system. Um, and it made me think about uh, this, this uh, image that I've had in my head since I was an undergrad about, you know, like maybe once people uh, die, this is a bit morbid maybe for a recording. I don't know where this recording right. is going. We don't, we don't need to use maybe, the whole recording. Okay, maybe after people die, their thoughts, their ideas, their memories, they all become this uh, ethereal sort of like network, kind of like a network graph of knowledge. And then they all go to the so-called like uh, uh, the place where people say is like the afterlife. And then you just kind of merge with everyone else. And then it just forms a more and more complete picture. So this is like an image I've had since I was uh, much a bit younger. I guess it's been 10 years now, less than 10 years. I think I, I officially, I wrote this, a poem about it when I was maybe 22 or 23. Cool. Um, so that's what I thought about, but I was more interested in what you imagined the big fungus to be because you had been thinking about it for a while and you wanted your brain to feed into it. So um, I wanted, I was curious, like, do you, like, how do you imagine it to look like first? Like, is this, is it a sort of just a hazy idea of like a network of ideas that allows people to understand each other a bit more? Or do you imagine someone um, having a particular situation or in a particular uh, circumstance and then looking at the big fungus to find guidance, to find a solution? Thank you. Um... So I've been feeding one mind map for 26 years, uh, you know, coming up on 27 in December. Wow, that's going to happen soon. Um, and I have an unusual experience here because I have knowledge that accrues in a, in a, in a re repository that is quirky and, and scares a lot of people, but highly functional for me, highly, highly functional. And from that, I had a bunch of thoughts about, oh my gosh, other people like other tools, but if we were sharing what we know, we could maybe get society moving a little better and faster towards some good results. And then I thought, well, there's been multiple projects to try to create some kind of big database or big whatever. There's uh, uh, David Christian's book the, the about big history, and he's got all sorts of resources. There's a bunch of other things trying to do this. And you could you could use a pompous name like the global knowledge base to solve all the world's problems or better we could try something sort of tongue-in-cheek something funny but also something that draws on the power uh, metaphoric power of mycelia uh, which uh, lots of people it's very funny how many mycelial fans you run into in the world but you start talking about fungi or mushrooms or whatever and they're like oh yeah 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 and um, mushrooms are incredibly powerful um, a funny small side note, uh, every year the, the local mycological society has an exhibit here near the zoo, and I've gone a couple times, yeah. and they will fill six tables the size of five foosball. Each, each of these yeah. long tables is arranged in like a sun kind of formation. Each of these tables is like three foosball tables put together, uh, and, and they're, they're uh, empty. So they bring some dirt and some moss and some bark and tree bits, and then they put varieties of mushrooms in there that they've just harvested from i'm assuming within 100 or 300 miles of here it's incredibly beautiful the variety is mind-blowing you're just like oh my god like like the the fungal life is crazy and 
the mushrooms that appear above ground are just the fruiting body of the mycelial network that is connecting underground that does a bunch of things that plants don't do. So there's this notion called the wood wide web, uh, which says that trees and soil are kind of communicating in ways we don't think about. And I don't mean here to impute communicating like humans do. I just mean that there's signals passing back and forth. And so trees are not good at getting minerals from soil, but they need minerals. Trees are really good at photosynthesis. And so they make sugars and carbon you know, products. Um, who's really good at getting minerals from soil? Mycelia. Mycelia basically ex um, excrete or, or put out acids and enzymes that dissolve minerals. They can then trade those minerals for sugars. And there's like an underground network of trade and, and chemical signaling. So uh, in a forest, uh, the, the trees on the far side might have an, an attack from a pest like a beetle. And that the pain of that injury to the forest will make its way across a signaling system that mycelia carry. So um, there's also this notion of rhizomes. And uh, there were two philosophers named uh, Deleuze and Gattari who wrote something about rhizomal networks back in the 60s before we had all these computers and all the stuff that we sort of take for granted now in the World Wide Web. So there's a lot of thinking about metaphorically how these connected ideas might live and connect us and how the ideas in some sense need to live in, in, a, in a context that is nutritive, that is growing, that is dissolving problems. Like, like the metaphors in here are really, really lovely. So I bought the domain, thebigfungus.org, uh, thinking, what could I start that other people might have a fun time joining, which would be the challenge of, how do we share what we know better? And I happen to be addicted to this brain-like tool, but I also don't have any I conceit that um, more than a little tail of people on the planet are going to like that display or that way of looking at information. So great. So how do I communicate with people using other tools like Kumu or Rome Research or Obsidian or what? There's a whole bunch of the, the umbrella category is tools for thinking, um, which are different from word processors and email, which are different from spreadsheets and databases. Those are, those are other sort of shared categories. And certainly the place most people put their ideas is like blogs, which has turned into Substack, right? So anybody who's trying to get a new, uh, their ideas out these days, the new blog is kind of Substack or it's substitutes like Beehive and Ghost, um, but they're busy publishing what they think. Oh, well, cool. That To me, that's raw materials because I, I subscribe to a whole mess of, of people um, who use Substack and I track what they write. So for example, let me just do a little screen share. Um, so here's uh, here's my brain. Uh, here are some of the fabulous fungal metaphors that I'm talking about. And then uh, here's a thought called Substack publications. I can jump to any thought in my brain. So these are all Substack pubs and there's a scroll bar down here. So this is A through P. And then there's a couple more out here to the right. And uh, some of these I follow closely, some of them not so much. But here's one called Truth on the Streets by Kevin Dahlgren. He wrote a post called Decriminalizing Drugs is a Death Sentence. And he is uh, he writes about Portland's homeless. Oh, he's a pretty extreme character writing about Portland politics. Um, but if you think that you can take any of these uh, and follow them into the particular node about what they're writing about and all that, um, this is a, the place where I curate and sort of, and when I'm curating, I think of myself as making little mycelial connections between things, right? So here's the Pope Hat report. Uh, so here's Kevin White, Pope Hat. Let's see if I've got some of his articles. Uh, pink. There we go. Here's some of, hello, you've been referred because you're wrong about the First Amendment. So, so I connected this to the First Amendment. Here's everything I've connected to the First Amendment for a while, mm -hmm. right? Okay. And, First yeah. Amendment is under the Bill of Rights. It's under freedom of speech. It's under religious freedom. It's under freedom of the press. Cool. And freedom of the press is its own topic that has a bunch of different things. Uh, and you can go up, down, and around in this way. And so I feel like I am manually making these little hyphae kind of connections. The hyphae are the, the leading edge of the little root system that mycelia throw out to reach further in and find new resources and you know connect to root systems and whatever else. Um, yeah. And I, and I have a feeling that if we can garden what we know better, we can change how journalism works, how science works, how elections work, 
how uh, all these different things, because um, a piece of what I'm working on right now is called the Neo Books Project. And Neo Books are basically deconstructed books that aren't really books. Uh, in fact, the first paragraph of the introduction of the Neo Book I'm writing says, thank you for buying this souvenir because the book version of something is like ideas frozen in carbonite that I'm now going to protect with digital rights management because I need to make a living somehow from my ideas. I'm writing all of my stuff open source. Uh, but for me, I want the ideas liberated so that they can actually be put to work to help fix the problems that we're all facing. Then a last thing I'll say, and then I'll pause for a second so we can go back and forth. Um, I'm very interested in what people who disagree with me strongly are saying also, and I want them to use whatever tool they're comfortable with to feed the big fungus so that we can compare notes and set up experiments and figure out what's up. So uh, I'm not a big fan of Steve Bannon. Uh, he is sort of the uh, evil genius that's been helping Trump for a long time. Here's Steve, uh, Steve Bannon in my brain. He did this interview here. This is a YouTube link. So if I click here, it'll open my browser to this interview with Zanny Minton Beddoes, who's editor in chief for The Economist. Um, and she does not do a great job of, of, of arguing with Bannon, but Bannon does a good job of declaring things he believes in. And I basically took notes on that conversation. And, and I will say that when you start taking apart what he says, I agree with a bunch of things that Bannon says. The party of Davos took care of themselves and let the devil take the hindmost. Yep. The party of Davos brought on the global financial crisis and the rise of China. And I had that connected to causes of the global financial crisis of the late 2000s. Right? So you could go here. And I, I for, for reasons I can't fully explain, I pu published three videos back uh, a couple of years ago, so called SNP uh, in 2020 during, during the uh, lockdown. I basically created uh, this little playlist of what the hell, how did we get into the global financial crisis? What caused it? And what did we or didn't we fix about it? Um, so that goes back to Bannon's argument. So, I, so some of his assertions I like, and some of them I don't like and I disagree with. This is interesting. And, and when you can get people to be more explicit about what they're arguing and why and agree or disagree with, that's based on this idea, you know, I hate immigrants. Immigrants should all go home because this, this, and this. Um, then at least you can have those conversations. You can also discover that we have more in common than what separates us, which is an important, uh, important lesson for me. And uh, Joe Cox, the uh, member of parliament who was who was stabbed to death in Britain, that was the, her famous saying. So um, I've got Joe Cox here, uh, and. Uh, Basically, we are far more united and have far more in common with each other than things that divide us. Uh, and here's a, a note in my brain about exercises that help us. And there's the, there's some really cool things that you know started in Denmark, all, all that we share, which is a really cool exercise. You can follow this link and go there. Um, so I, I, I think that we're what we know and what we believe is pretty intertwingled, very connected. Um, Another favorite saying is Ted Nelson's, everything is deeply intertwingled. Um, I, I'm one of the few people who has a single big brain file. I don't have a series of different brain databases. And I do that because I have no commercial reason to do, separate them, but also because I can kind of get from everything to everything and I need it all to be in the same place. If it weren't, I would have a, a problem trying to figure out which brain file to add something to or where something was. Where for me, it's like, it's just all in here. Uh, but as you can see, even in a relatively full screen, it's not that confusing because everything is deeply intertwined. Uh, is a quote from Ted Nelson. It's one of my beliefs. It's about global unity. He wrote about that in his book, Computer Lib Dream Machines, that was published in 74, which is one of many visions that have inspired builders of global brains like um, the big fungus. Mm. So now I'll stop. I... <laughs> No, that's it's good too. Um, but as you were talking, um, I mean, first it's it's good for you to like share your entire logic because that helps. And as you were uh, sharing it, I started looking at everything you were showing through the mycelium metaphor that you were talking about earlier. And I think it could be helpful to actually really commit to that metaphor and see where it goes. So. In the mycelium metaphor, you have the hidden part, like 
versus the showing part. So the hidden mycelium versus the fruiting body. Yep. And, oh, I recognize this. I remember he said, oh, I'm, I'm feeling something. This, so, this is, I, I agree with what you're saying. This is, I disagree. Okay. Um, and then... W without interrupting you, which is what I'm doing right now. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so if, let's say, your brain, if Jerry's brain is the hidden mycelium, and it's sort of, let's say, getting minerals. And the mushroom itself that we associate is the fruiting body. Then what would be the metaphorical fruiting body in um, this funny you should say. Funny you should say that. Uh, so the Neobooks project that I described a moment ago. Um, it, so books are mushrooms they're fruiting bodies out of a body of, of ideas but so are presentations so are video documentaries so are other kinds of cultural artifacts that we know of and point to as a thing right mm, because Books, mm, because they disseminate well they exactly disseminate. well because they they rise above we cut them off we eat them we we read them whatever but also mushrooms are when 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 mycelium needs to reproduce and, and travel because the, the mushrooms are what carry spores and spores are the reproductory system. So you're exactly right. It's the dissemination of ideas through these well-known cultural artifacts. And the, the because the most notable of those is the book, that's why I call this project Neo Books. But I don't, I'm not really interested in writing books. And I think of a book as a roll-up of a bunch of nuggets of information that should be reusable and that should be alive. So each nugget uh, in a neo book is a community maintained page. I mean, I will author a bunch of nuggets for a neo book I'm writing about design from trust because that's what I'm doing right now. But I'm writing them all to GitHub, which is a public repo repository of Markdown files. And the reason I'm using GitHub is that that makes them publicly accessible. And GitHub has an awkward but useful way of uh, having other people suggest changes. GitHub also lets people fork what I've created. The first thing you do when you look at somebody's work in, in GitHub is you fork their repository into your workspace. Then you look at it, make changes or whatever, and then you suggest changes. I like that, that work style as a way of improving the mycelial nodes. And then you might decide to write a mushroom, to basically to write a book uh, yourself. And if you used some of my nodes in your book, rock on. I would love that. And by doing so, we're violating one of the unspoken assumptions, or maybe even spoken assumptions, of how books work, which is that every chapter, every segment of every book should be unique and written by that author, unless very carefully otherwise specified. You know, there's fair use quotation, you know, quotation rights and all that kind of stuff. But we expect every book to be original and unique. I expect a book is just a it's just a map around a cluster of nodes in the mycelial network of ideas that have to come out and manifest. And we might have two books that have a very different conclusion about what to do, but the first half of our books might be the same because we're building our books about ChatGPT and its influences on the world. And we agree entirely on the history of ChatGPT, the, the power and effects. We just disagree about what's going to happen to it. Awesome. And they wouldn't mm -hmm. have to be books. They could be videos. They could be uh, speeches, whatever. And once you do each of those artifacts, once you have the book, you connect it back in to the mycelial network, right where the right where its closest node was, right? I, I think, so it sounds like in this metaphor, so let's say the brain is the mycelium and the fruiting body is the dissemination uh, part of the information in the mycelium or like the valuable resource in the mycelium. Um, and, and I'm not and sure I agree if, with the, the thing you just said. Mm. Yeah. Can I interrupt you there? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, because I think the mycelium is the valuable resource. We in society have mistaken the book as the important thing uh, or, or the movie or whatever. The important thing is the community of people working on the ideas and making them better. So for me, I want to invite people into the mycelial network to be curators and contributors and improvers of the nuggets that inhabit that space underground metaphorically, where anybody then is producing artifacts that other people will, will go and read or watch or whatever, which will hopefully attract them into the network to come be contributors and collaborators. Now, Wikipedia is always among the 10th most visited websites on the planet, 
the number of people who, who actually improve Wikipedia compared to the people who use it, it's a really, really tiny number. So I'm kind of thinking there will be a similar kind of balance between the number of people busy doing what I'm obsessively doing every day, which is feeding my brain. Other people are obsessively feeding other note-taking systems or tools for thought. I don't think that number needs to be that big for there to be a fruitful network that people can join. And if you join and you suggest a change to us to a couple sentences, or you add an idea, or you reuse material and put it in your thing somewhere else, you're helping build out this network of ideas. And then when I say this could change how elections work, you could then connect yourself to a, a, a subset of ideas written by a person or a group of people whose ideas you love. Let's say you love deep adaptation and Jem Bendel's thinking. You could basically ally yourself to them and you could maybe proxy your votes to them mm -hmm. so that within the domain of adaptation and climate policy and all that kind of stuff, they could claim legitimately to represent 2,300,222 people who have proxied over their votes through this mycelial network. Mm -hmm. Does that think, does that even make sense? I mean, I'm on the same page with you here. I think the, um, I should have prefaced what I was saying with like traditionally, let, or let's say based off of all the media that exists right now, the books and the movies are the political bodies. Yep. <laughs> but maybe my guess is what you're interested in is you want the mycelium itself to also be a fruiting body, like when people can actually disseminate ideas within the, um, so, the so I'm, itself. I, I'm not sure the analogy carries that way because if, mm -hmm. we could break the mycelial mushroom kind of boundary. But I think that the what's happening in mycelial is also a kind of dissemination. It's the hyphae that are connecting and nutrients being exchanged. And what, what I think maybe the problem is, and what you're asking is highlighting this, is that in modern culture, we have we have made the cultural artifacts called movies and books and documentaries the important primary things. And those are finished goods that you only watch. Like a book does not contain a way to talk to the author. In fact, the author is going to discourage that because eh, too many people are reading my book. Now, nowadays with YouTube and with media and with Substack and whatever, and comments on Substacks and comments on YouTubes and all that, a good author will actually participate in those communities, but still they're participating in some random little comment threads that are lost on some, I'm interested in that conversation happening in the frothy, nutritive mycelium itself. Now there's issues of scale. Um, the three words that I've heard kill more good ideas are it won't scale, um, but scale is very adaptable. Scale, you can sort of mess with scale a lot because People like working in small groups and then feeding back their ideas, et cetera, et cetera. There's there's a bunch of there's a bunch of practical issues to think about here, but but I want the mycelial part to also be about distribution. But it's about living distribution of the connective power of good ideas and of collaboration. Where once these things have fruited, and I'm putting my hands above screen sort of to to illustrate like the mushroom pops up above ground, those artifacts are more inert. They're finished. They're polished, and we think of them as where the value is. And as you were doing, the spore distribution is, in fact, dissemination, but there's another kind of distribution of dissemination happening underground that we don't notice because it's almost invisible to us. Because when we stand on the ground, when we walk across a field out close, you know, close to home, you don't realize that there's mycelial networks everywhere underground connecting up all the different parts that make for healthy soil. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. that was a, a long interruption, but <laughs> but but you're you're making clearer for me what these distinctions are, and that some of them are, are artificial. They're they're part of modernity in our, our modern society. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, exactly. And actually, yeah. I would argue that, like, um, in fact, the so-called like modern ma major uh, media artifacts that are supposedly modern are actually um, outdated, considering the technology that's available, which is what you said you actually can have a living like sort of interaction like knowledge is evolving with the creator with the audience and then they kind of feed into each other Bingo. and it's just that we don't have a good representation or a format for that to actually be alive because even in blogs we're operating as if it was a newspaper uh, model where i set out artifacts and then the artifact would be there if i edit it then, oh, you edited the previous content. Um, so in that sense, I feel that 
the mycelium itself can, like if there could be a format for the mycelium, like or a process for users to contribute, people to contribute to the mycelium, yes. and a way to view it that um, allows for this living, like pulsing change that's accessible to everyone. And actually, like going, that's cool. And going through this metaphor even more, you mentioned earlier, like how trees create the sugars and mycelium create the minerals, and they're in exchange. And the first thought that comes to mind is let's say this living network already exists. Um, we have built one, the internet allows this to exist. We have built it. There's the format to consume, the format to contribute, all in the same place. Um, what would be the tree? Like, would the tree be, uh, let's say, open AI? Because they're constantly on the lookout for fresh data, fresh human-created data. Mm -hmm. um, would the tree be like a um, benchmarking um, consultancy there, or, or like a big bank or a big um, mergers and acquisitions firm where they're trying to look at trends and how uh, attitudes are, are changing? Mm -hmm. um, and does the potential big fungus want to create this sort of exchange relationship with the tree, with the, the trees? Um, are you done? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so you're kind of expanding the metaphor out to the whole, let, let's call it the wood wide web, which includes the trees, the plants, you know, all the, all the other parts of the ecosystem, which is great. Uh, and what's funny is, um, there's a bunch of like hedge funds that are, I think, really bad for society. So as you were saying that, I was like, some of those are predators and they're basically, they're basically diseases that are attacking the ecosystem. They're, they're not healthy. But the other items, and I, I haven't thought this through at all, uh, so thanks for asking it, a tree or a flower in this setting is, I think, just another entity in the setting. And the mycelial connections crisscross and connect all of them. So a tree might, you know, a sequoia could be a Bank of America or something like that, maybe. And and it's dangerous to overextend the metaphor and, and so forth. But, um, and and um, the primitive way of thinking about what, what role sugar would play, as you just write, wrote in the chat, is maybe sugar is money, although... I, I hate to do that, but but that's a possibility that there's an exchange of money for for nutritive for nutrients of some sort or or something like that. And 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 I, I'm I'm trying to be cautious about overextending the metaphor because because sometimes the metaphor will get you in trouble uh, as much as it elucidates because suddenly you're trying to you're trying to live up to the metaphor, but it's not actually resonant with what happens in the real world. Um, also, I, I put in the chat a, a video that I uh, published a couple of years ago called Today's Internet is Stuck in Mainstream Media Metaphors, which means we're way deep into the inter internet revolution. It's 94, 95 when we get the internet and the web as a public utility. And you would think we would have figured out how to think better together and talk better together through it. But um, Substack is like a magazine, like a newsletter, and YouTube is like television and movies. And we have email, which is like, guess what? Uh, mail. Um, and then we do live calls, which are like phone calls with video. Isn't that kind of cool? But we, we have not done a good job of thinking beyond old school, mainstream media, old school media, um, into what new capacities uh, are possible here. And there's a whole bunch of good reasons why we haven't done that. And I think that in another 50 years, we will be seeing our ability to communicate and share ideas very differently from today. We, we, will, have out, we will have left those things behind. Um, the, 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 the easy, the go-to analogy here is early cinema. So the first people making movies put the camera on a tripod and put it in front of a stage and recorded a live theater because everybody knew what live theater was. We've had it forever. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a major part of human culture. Um, then somebody says, hey, what if we put the tripod on a little dolly and we roll the camera around? And what if we sort of cut and then intersperse and mix the film and, and move things around and, and shoot from here to there and then do cuts and editing? And all those things were invented and we get the language of cinema and now we have movies as they are, which are, which are a, a plateau above, but still very limited, right? And so we're now inventing the rhetoric 
<laughs> and patterns of how this new way of thinking together might work. And we have these huge interruptions, which we haven't mentioned at all, like intellectual property rights, the need, the compulsion to make a living from your ideas, which is a tremendous drain on society. Because um, I, I did another short video called the, the Creator's Dilemma. And in it, I say, hey, you're a creative person. You wrote a book. On the one hand, you probably want as many people to read your book as might benefit from it or be entertained by it or whatever. That you have that, you, you probably have that instinct. Emily Dickinson didn't think her poetry would ever be seen by anybody, but she's she's more the exception than the rule. On the other hand, if you're going to make a living from your creation, you want to lock down the intellectual property and make sure nobody rips you off and makes a living from your work, et cetera, et cetera. So there's this huge dilemma you face of, okay, I guess I'm going to put myself in the hands of the publishing industry or whatever else, and they know how to protect IP. Uh, Jack Valenti, the former head of the MPAA, the Movie Production Association of America, um, famously said copyright should last forever minus a day. And I think copyright is like one of our big problems. We, we have completely overdone copyright to the point where it deeply affects our ability to imagine what's possible and how we might think together. And that doesn't mean that people shouldn't make a living from their ideas. It's just that they could make a living a different way. It's why I like tipping models like Patreon and even Substack, where people will pay you for a subscription to your Substack. That's cool. They're supporting you, but you know, most many Substacks have most of the writing open, and then they'll offer something else special for people who want to pay more or something like that. That's that's pretty groovy. Mm. But if we yeah. don't if we don't think and work in the open, we can't achieve most of this. I'm interested in um, creating a or like help having this become the reality where um, people can imagine, like you said, imagine what's possible instead of what's under copyright or what's in a box or category. And you've been working on software thinking, to try to do that. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm working on the same thing or not the same thing, but towards a very similar or the same vision cool. uh, with group where you can, it's an app where you can save and share content across different apps. Um, and, but I kind of, I want to dive a bit deeper into this. I'm thinking like to make big fungus happen right now. Um, and let's say, sh let's say the sugar in the metaphor is, is money, like as a, as a game, lo not locked onto this idea. Um, and then the minerals in the brain, in the mycelium, are, let's say, um, first, the individual nodes, like the individual data points that you've collected, but more importantly, the relationships between them. And let's say um, already people are contributing to it, and each person has their own way of connecting the dots or even organizing the things. So... If we were to make that vision possible, we kind of need to find the right trees <laughs> or vegetation to build this exchange with that won't completely cannibalize and destroy um, the thing as a parasite would, let's say. Uh -huh. And then eventually establish the mycelium as a long-term player. So, for the purpose of this metaphor game, I'm trying to think what would be good exchangers um, of sugar. And I'm also thinking like in terms of uh, marketing channels, mm -hmm. market makers, people who could help the big fungus actually catch on to an existing community instead of, let's say, individuals or, or like, let's say you as a champion of the big fungus trying to reach out individually, like one by one, getting people to join. Mm -hmm. Um, like what would be good market makers, good channels where they would benefit from the minerals and then big fungus would benefit from the sugar question. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple things. I'm, I'm, I think money is important and money also really sort of um, can corrupt 
a lot of dynamics if it's used in the wrong way in different places. Um, and one of the one of the issues I just pointed out was you know intellectual property overprotection in order to lock down fund you know, uh, flows of money. And so, what are the sugars? What are the minerals? Is a really good question. For me, I'm really interested in the ideas and how they manifest. And I've been talking about these ideas in the abstract. One nugget that could be an idea is um, people uh, assume good intent. Uh, and assume good intent is a starting foundational principle for the internet, for the World Wide Web, for Wikipedia, and also for my design from trust, because it totally makes sense. So that's that's to me a, a, like a foundational nugget, if you will. It's like, it's like a, a, an Ur principle that matters. And that winds up being a node for interactions and for connections and for, and you could debate that <clears throat> where you can say, hey, um, most people are terrible actors is the, is, and you should assume that they're going to try to hurt you is the opposite of that, right? And that tension to me is super interesting. The exchange of ideas, there is the flow of, of these kinds of things. Um, then you can think of how do we market this and get more people to use it in the sense of how, you know, where, where is the market made and where do people meet? Or we could think about how do we make this so beneficial that it's contagious? And how do we make it so that people start availing themselves of it, learn about it, mostly through word of mouth, and then occasionally through articles through mainstream media? I mean, um, Jim, uh, Jim Fallows, who is a senior, senior editor, I think editor-in-chief at The Atlantic, he's written about me and my brain several times in The Atlantic a long time ago. Um, and he's a, he's a friend. And so if, if Jim decided to write about an update about this and talk about the big fungus, that would propagate through mainstream media in the old school ways and more people would learn about it and maybe come and try to you know join the community. But I, but I have this funny feeling that the, the, one of the greatest agents of change is, is people trying something out because somebody they trust invited them to try it. That's my favorite transformational uh, tool. And that's not advertising. Um, and it's, it's, it's sort of broadcasty, but not really. I mean, if people write glowingly about something in, a, in their subsect post, that broadens attention as well. That's great. But, but I'm interested in there being so much benefit from participating because things actually start to work better and make more sense that you get all your friends to, to try it. Um, I, a long time ago, when instant messaging first showed up, um, um, it, it it caught fire and took over the landscape. Everybody started using um, ICQ, uh, AOL AIM, and a couple others, Yahoo Messenger. Um, it, it, it ate the landscape and none of those companies spent a dime on marketing. It ate the landscape because, oh my gosh, you mean I can see whether Joy is online and I can just type to her without interrupting her like a phone call does, right? And, and so everybody was like, here, here, Joy, Joy, you need to install this. You, and I had a, a really funny conversation yesterday with a friend of mine who said he, he was dating a woman back when who tried to get him to use Messenger and he was resisting. He was like, no, I don't see how this is going to work until he relented and installed it. And then he was immediately like, oh my God, why didn't I just do this earlier? Why was I fighting this, right? That's the dynamic I love is how do we get people to participate? And then there are tiers of participation. As I said earlier, a few people will be obsessive, anal, retentive, really in the details, fleshing out and, and rephrasing and improving the wording of these ideas and how they get used. Another tier of people will be reworking and remixing the ideas and saying, oh, I like this set of ideas, but I, you know, I'm just going to use what they did. And I'm going to make a new documentary that says this, 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 this. Fabulous. And then if you're watching the documentary, you'll be able to work your way back to the nodes that it was based on. And I think we don't have that. All media is sort of all separate and doesn't, it doesn't lead back well. The best we do is a blog post or a Substack letter that has a lot of links embedded in it that go to the resources. And I, I love writers who use embedded links really well. I think, I think embedded linking is a, is a, a nice art of the modern era. And it's the start, it's the starting point for a lot of what's possible here. Yeah, and I, I think to the second point, like make it so good that they can't ignore you. This is what I categorize it. You as. put that in the chat. I totally agree with the notes you took. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that might be coming soon um, because of um, LLMs. And the funny thing about LLMs is that they actually are a huge graph um finally like if you look deep inside them they're a huge graph 
that has things related to each other further and closer together. And, but the problem is that you, if you search on Google right now, you're getting a lot of um, fake websites that were generated by chatbots Oops. here to, as an SEO farm. Um, uh, and the quality is going down. Like, and uh, ChatGPT and Perplexity um, AI, for example, they are trying to um, provide you more valuable answers through LLMs. Um, but ultimately, like, that's going to devolve into, like, poor and poor quality if they don't control the sort of data that they're training on, right. um, which is harder and harder to do. Like, and this is happening in images as well. So my guess is that um, in a couple of years, it's going to really like wreak havoc on the quality of information online. And then human curation is going to be more and more important if you want high quality data. Um, so at a moment like that, uh, something that's hand cured by humans like the big fungus um, could be really valuable for even like the average user who doesn't like to go down rabbit holes. I learned that not everyone goes down rabbit holes uh, and not everyone wants um, complex answers with hyperlinks. Some of, sometimes they just want a single answer. Um, so maybe the key to the big fungus working um, once the situation arrives, which um, um, would be to make it easy to use for people who aren't interested in complexity, who aren't interested in being wrong, because uh, you are also saying, like, assume good intent, assume everyone's on the same page. There's a lot of people who um, don't want to and or like they're not incentivized to do that. Um, it doesn't mean that, let's say, they bump into a random person in the street. They don't assume good intent. But some people, um, maybe they're feeling lonely or lost or like a stranger in their home. And they just want to be reassured they want to be proven right like someone gets me and like maybe another part is of big fungus is almost like making being potentially a little wrong less threatening um and um allowing them to find familiarity without um being stuck in a stuck in something that was made to trap you somewhere um, so this is what I'm banking on actually. And ideally I'm, I'm hoping for not such a dramatic collapse of information systems. I don't think that'll happen, but I am hoping that I do feel like people are going to get tired of AI generated, um, content. Um, and I think that's when big fungus bloop other curation platforms that value humanity and, um, that has the hand curated stuff will actually go up in value. Yeah, period. Curious what you think. Um, love that, all of it. Um, so uh, several different things. Um, one is that I have a funny feeling like um, one of my favorite people talking about LLMs and all that is Ethan Mollick at Wharton who teaches innovation and entrepreneurship. He wrote a book titled Co-Intelligence, and his, just, his advice is just very sensible. He says, this stuff is really powerful. You're not going to notice the power unless you've put in 10 plus hours with, a, you know, with one of the better frontier tools, blah, 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 blah. But then he points out that the kinds of things that he's having, having his students do, because he is not trying to get his students to not use these tools. He's assigning the tools and then raising the bar. So he says, uh, a couple of years ago, I was one of, one of my student projects would take all semester. It would be like create a business plan and a marketing plan or whatever. He says, now, now we'll do that in, on a week's assignment. And they're expected to have all these kinds of things. And they can do them using ChatGPT or Claude or whatever in an hour, right? And, and they can get a pretty reasonable plan coming together. And, and a business plan or a marketing plan or some kind of creative endeavor doesn't need to be citing stuff that it's making up. It's not, this doesn't need to hallucinate and you're hopefully going to proof it. And then there's this whole question about human eyes need to vet and proof all the stuff that's coming out of all these devices. But then a lot of teachers around the world are, are, are sitting here going, oh my God, so every student is going to cheat on every exam. And I think this has a really interesting effect of possibly pushing us back toward oral exams. Remember oral exams? Have you ever, have you ever had an oral exam? 
That, like, yes, that, a long that, time ago. Yeah. That's how we used to test people. We used to say, hey, let's have a conversation about this topic, which we, we're the goal of this semester was your mastery of the subject matter. Let's go for it. Now, we'll immediately get into the scarcity problem of every teacher can't do that with every student. That's because we have a scarcity model in education about how education works, where only people with PhDs in education whom we're not paying enough can be teachers. That's stupid. We should fix that. Um, so there's ways of dissolving that problem also. But I love the idea that the proliferation of LLMs, which is likely to pollute the information landscape, and I, I sent you a link in the chat to a, a thought in my brain called, are we at the end of a temporary golden age of knowledge accessibility that showed up with the internet? Because before the internet, you had to go to your local library and look through the card catalog and hope that a book was on the shelf. Bah. So that was the opening of this, this wow golden age. And maybe the pollution from LLMs and the, the, the snake eating its own tail is one of the metaphors here, the Ouroboros, is going to corrupt that. Maybe it drives us back toward a lot more human involvement, which is one of the questions I really care about. I'm, uh, uh, one of the other questions I'm, I, uh, in my background is um, how to be a good cyborg. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't like the word cyborg. I really like it because I think that we're going to have to meld with our software better. And it's either that or be replaced by software. So it's, it's enhance or replace is kind of the equation we're facing. And tools like Bloop and other kinds of tools that help us, get, that give us superpowers for filtering, processing, and sharing, and connecting, and then manifesting into mushrooms, <clears throat> those are the great power tools. Those are the tools we want more people using. Um, so um, then you also said that um, LLMs are kind of my seal. Totally. Like the, the way that neural networks work is that you train them on data that then keeps rearranging the weights between connected artificial neurons in a big exercise in matrix math, which is now dramatically more complicated than what I just said. But what winds up happening is, is some kind of end space representation of a body of, of, of knowledge, work, or facts, or things out in the world that it got trained on. And it, it's, it's a representative map, very much so. And I love that. Uh, so, uh, and then another question that arises with LLMs is, are they going to obsolete our need to read books, our need to write books, our need to take notes, our need to do sense-making? We're just going to feed everything into the engines. They're going to be out there scouring everything and swallowing it and digesting it and metabolizing it. So why don't we just have a big long conversation with them and not worry so much about all this? And I think that's incredibly dangerous and short-sighted, like unbelievably short-sighted. I think we need to aggressively keep humans in the loop and figure out how to blend better with all of these new powers. But, but there's a huge danger that um, a lot of people like, yeah, note taking is overrated. It's a lot of work. Uh, why bother? These devices are just way smarter than us. And, I, and I'm thinking, I want to use these devices uh, and intelligences to make my note taking and curation faster, more efficient, more effective. But I know that if, 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 a, if a fact or an event hasn't passed through my neurons, I don't know it exists. I don't know it's even a thing. Right. And my work curating my brain means that I slow down and have to think a little bit longer and harder about everything I curate into my brain. Cause I'm like, is it worth remembering? Where do I put it? Um, what do I connect it to? What should I call it? What else can I learn? I go through that little loop like 60 times a day. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And, and I also and think it's, yeah, it's fruitful. It's useful. No, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about, um, as you said, you, Okay, first, uh, something I wrote in the chat. So you said sharing, curating, and manifesting. And I feel like that really represents well what the big fun is for me to do. Um, it needs to do all the three things um, really well. And then, uh, but related to what you were just saying, uh, which is when I curate things, I spend a lot of time to figure out how it's connected. And in the future, people might look to this as maybe a better source of information than traditional search engines. Um, this also raises the potential of uh, bad actors. Uh, let's say someone who has really extreme ideas and 
maybe they're not carefully curating it. Maybe they're on purpose connecting it to random dots, or maybe they're even um, ill. Uh, they have a conspiracy idea and they're connecting it. And all of a sudden you have um, maybe too much noise again. Like there's a, there's a balance that needs to be struck. And I think Wikipedia does quite well with it. Um, somehow, I, I mean, I know they have like this um, idea of neutrality. They, they have multiple edits going back and forth. They have very passionate contributors. Um, so it means that the big fungus also needs some sort of uh, immune system. Uh, where like either it shows a log of what was edited and who, and then people can dispute it. And then like you can recognize uh, things that don't make sense. There needs to be some argument happening within it too. Um, that's all I have to say at the moment. Awesome. Uh, you triggered a bunch of other things too. Uh, one of my favorite nature stories to tell metaphorically is about leaf cutter ants which are the little ants that are carrying leaves like in the jungle or in the forest. And you're like, what are they doing? And it turns out that leaf cutter ants can't digest leaves. They cannot eat a leaf and live off the leaf. It's like, so what the hell are they doing? Uh, it turns out what they're doing is they're carrying these little bits of leaf into their nest where they hand them off to a sub genre of that kind of that species of ant, which mulches up the leaf matter and they put the spit and the leaf matter on a fungus that they have a symbiotic relationship with. So if the fungus is healthy, the ant, the hive is healthy, and the fungus metabolizes the leaf matter and oozes some nectar and also little tasty globules of fungus. That the, that's what the ant, that's what the ants all eat. <clears throat> it turns out that the leaf, the, the the subset of ants that are at the fungus face, have a white powder all on their thorax and are all over here. And so biologists like scrape that off and said, "What is this stuff? Why are they all covered in in, in powder?" That powder is a complementary bacterium that is like an inoculant to protect the fungus and the ants against external invaders. It's it's it's, it's, it's almost like a vaccine. I'm, I'm sure I'm screwing up the metaphors because I'm not a life scientist. Um, but somehow nature has figured out to put complementary bacteria to help them keep this, keep this area clean of things that might actually harm the fungus and therefore harm, harm the hive. I also think of myself curating my brain as a lonely ant at the fungus face. And that phrase right there is the birth of the big fungus metaphor for me. So I've been sitting here squirreling away for 26 years, putting 60 odd things a day into my brain because when I started using it, I covered startups and I was interviewing startups and I put them in my brain, who funded them, who did their PR, what category are they in, who competes with them, who are the principals, what are their product names? I would just do that over and over so that at the end of the day, when a journalist called me and said, I'm writing an article about buddy lists or instant messaging, I, while we were talking, I would bring it up. And my unaided recall of buddy lists is maybe 10 companies. My brain has 300 or 600 or whatever, you know, all the ones I've heard of, because I was just note taking compulsively along the way and knowledge accrues, it accumulates, right? So, um, so that's one whole big thing. Then, then, and and it's it's related to bad actors because when I say assume good intent, for example, um, it's not naive uh, assumption. You have to you have to be aware that people are bad actors out there. There's a lot. There's plenty of bad actors out there. Um, there's a distinction I really like. It's between being defenseless and being undefended. And if you're defenseless, that means if I come up and try to bop you on the nose, you don't have any training. You will likely get a bloody nose. If you're undefended, it means your hands might be down in a resting position or you, you might not look like you're in a defended position. But if I try to bop you on the nose, you will block my you will block my blow and be able to defend yourself. I think it's really important to be undefended. And that means being smart about how to defend yourself, being vigilant about possible attacks and what might happen. So the naive, the na set the naive thing aside. This is not about blind willingness to accept that everybody's good. It's not at all that worldview. It's just a it's just a worldview that says when you start with a positive offer, and I don't really like game theory, but in game theory and tit for tat games, the winning strategy is to start with a good with a good first offer. Like start with something positive. That's the winning strategy. And I'm like, good. So game theory sort of plays out. Game theory to me is 
too much outside of how the real how real humans work to be uh, all that useful in thinking about humans. Um, but I think it's important for these systems in the big fungus to be undefended and then to be permeable to points of view they really hate. So I, I used Steve Bannon as, as an exercise earlier because I think he's an evil genius. Um, uh, he does a bunch of really stupid things, but he is really clever, clever, clever as a strategist for the far, far right. And he's busy trying to train and, and, and mentor the, the world's far right autocrats so that they can take over the world, so that they can collapse civilization as we know it, and so that he can help build the great transition and, and, and be the one who builds the new civilization. He, that, he wants to be the architect of the next civilization after he topples this one. And and that's another thing I wanted to bring in here when I, I wrote power in the chat. So much of what's happening out there is power. It's a power game. And it's not that people might make a mistake or be dumb and put something wrong in. It's that it's a power play and they're very intentionally misinforming. It, it's very, much of this is completely strategic and intentional. And you've got to be able to flag it and put marker die on it somehow uh, so that other people notice, oh, wait a minute. That's connected to this other nexus of ideas that are all part of a cluster of stuff that's stupid or not stupid. It's really actually smart because usually the misinformation taps into something you believe and then plays it out in a way that's like, oh my God, that's nuts. You know, so um, vaccines, a lot of women were worried about the MMR vaccine uh, hurting their children. Boy, did like the, the whole uh, blue pill thing just like took them over and said, come on, you know, come on, come on down here. Let's, uh, uh, let, let's go do, um, I'm even forgetting its name. Came out of 4chan. Um, I, anyway, I'll figure it out. Um, but all of that, it, we're, we're sort of just sitting there waiting for uh, these things to happen. And we shouldn't, we, we should be sort of actively thinking about these things and sharing them. And yeah. for some people, it's going to be work that they're probably already doing, but they'll be more visible. And for other people, it, it might mean watching less of the Kardashians and being a little bit more engaged in helping your community do stuff, which would not be a bad thing. Because one of the things that consumer society brought us was immense, expensive, tasty distractions that take us away from the, the work of being in society. Mm. Interesting. I feel like the last thing you said was quite, it's, it's quite me. Um, but I, I might think about that a bit after. Um, but I'm looking at, I'm making sure we can talk a bit before the hour is up. And I wanted to share in response to you saying, uh, like, how to build this. Like, what I heard is you were asking yourself how we can build a way of discourse and a philosophy or even a platform where these rules of, um, assuming good intent and being undefended but able to defend and all these things are just embedded within the futures and then people are in, like intuitively able to work in this way without having to be towed off by moderators for example um and i all i'm i always like to share in response to that this multiplayer game called sky children of the light and it's sky children it's called, of the light yeah, Sky Children of the Light. They were a big inspiration for Bloop when I was working on it as part of my master's thesis. And then also Bloop when I was funded by Techstars and I had the money initially to build out, you know, a lot of the features I had in mind. Um, and um, as for the initial run, like we ran out of money and also the market changed. So now I'm having a different approach uh, with a similar idea, but as for what the game did, is that they were also really, they were interested in creating a multiplayer game where the people, people were kind to each other, they were helping each other, and um, they communicated without hurting each other and stuff like this. And they found it really difficult in the beginning because a lot of multiplayer games were based around um, shooting, mm -hmm. um, winning over someone else, and there's a natural instinct for some people to troll. Um, in this situation and they just iterated and iterated and they took away so many features and added new ones like they took away um, the ability to chat when you meet someone uh, for the first time they took away even the ability to see another player's build before you like both of you consent 
via this candle exchange. Cool. And then you build up your a friendship through mutual giving. Like you give each other candles that you earn through your daily quests in order to be able to hold hands, to transport to each other, and then eventually to chat. And That's then great. they also take away the ability to give personal information in the chats. Um, so like in the beginning, you're just interacting with like motions and emojis. And they also found that in order to encourage this sort of collaboration, the levels at some point need to be impossibly hard. And the evil bosses, like the um, opponents, need to be unbeatable. So like you cannot win over them. So wow. everyone is like a teeny, like a uh, child to ch child of light. And then as you progress over the levels, it just gets impossible. Like the only thing you can do is hide and help wow. each other through the terrain. And then, so like the first playthrough, I remember at some point we had like, I had comrades, I had friends, maybe like five people um, together, but maybe I only knew two of them. Um, one person knew everyone, so he could hold hands with everyone. Um, and when we completed the final level, I felt like I had just gone to war with fellow, fellow veterans and we had made it out. And, wow. Uh, it, it just creates such a strong emotional emotional bond. But I, I saw their um, development speech and they were saying it took so long to figure this out. They made several versions where people were just trolling each other yep. or not able to help each other. So and, I and find they, that they didn't really... Give up. And they didn't give up, yeah. which is like a miracle. Yeah, they didn't give up. Like, but this game is not perfect. You know, like you can still figure out ways to transfer um, private, like individual information. Yeah. And in my experience, after the final level, you can replay, but the relationships I built afterwards were less intense. And I also um, lost a way to maintain the contact with the initial like five veterans that I, I, I beat the level. Yeah. Um, but I do find it really effective in the emotional design. They also have great sound imagery. Um, the mechanics were there. And I think there is potential to take some of that and bring it more to like a social platform. Um, yeah. Totally Instead right. of a platform like Twitter where the mechanics is, let me scream oh. and people will hear. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah. God, I, I'm... I'm Twitter user number 509, meaning I'm the 509th nice. person who ever signed up for Twitter because um, nice. my friend Charles was was like earlier than me and he was like, you should try this thing. And then I followed him and he was great. And this is back in the days when it was in texting. It wasn't an app. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on the web. It was just texting. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the second person I followed was terrible. So that made me not use it for a while, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, shoot. You just reminded me of something that I'm now I've now forgotten. Gone. Texting, horrible person, didn't um, follow. Okay. Shoot, I should have written it in the chat, which is how I how I usually remind myself of these things. Uh, it'll come back. Um, this is good. This is like rich. There's, there's a lot of good stuff here. Thank you for helping me think through the the big fungus in lots My of pleasure. good and useful ways. It's really ways. fun. Yeah, it's fun um, to do this. Yeah. Oh, I just remembered it. Um, so there's a, uh, in Taiwan, there's the minister uh, without portfolio named Audrey Tang, who is brilliant. Um, I've interviewed her and, and stuff like that and met her. Um, and they created a platform called Polis, P-O-L dot I-S, which is uh, mostly for floating ideas in with the, with the public and getting a sense of how people feel about the different, uh, the different ideas. But they they did one, they did probably many subtle things. But one thing that I learned that they did was they removed the reply feature on their threads. So if you want to say something, you've got to go start a new thread. You can't reply and do a flame war to anybody. And and just removing that thing we think of as obvious, like of course, you, you know, on any discussion forum, you'd have to have a reply feature. Removing that changed the nature of. Uh, conversation on the platform. And I, I imagine there's lots of other, you know, deeper lessons they've had, but I, I'm like the same thing for Sky is they had to very carefully engineer and engineer out some basic assumptions, right? 
-hmm. And then in real life, when you see, you, you see what they look like and that influences what we think and what, all, mm -hmm. all of our unconscious biases show up and all those other good things, all those other messy things. Um, so games allow you to actually mask things better. I, I really liked back in the day of text adventure games. You know, you were in a dark forest, mm -hmm. there are paths north, south, and east. Um, in the social games like Muds and Moos very early on, um, I loved that it was text only. And I regretted when we started getting more visual because in text only, like you'll get young men who turn who turn into a, a woman's persona online. And then without knowing it, they suddenly walk around online as a woman, which is, a, I think, a very different experience from walking around online as a man. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then they walk a mile in someone else's shoes without thinking they were doing that. And I think you learn you learn life lessons that way that are really good. And I heard a story about two kids who figured out they loved Nintendo or something or Sony PlayStation, and they they became great buddies. And they were on opposite ends of a political divide. I think Israeli Palestinian or something like that. They were you know or Pakistani Indian. They they were you know very opposite politically and would have avoided each other or never met otherwise. But they managed to become deep friends through a game. I think those things are great. And I think we should also play more uh, in order to get to know each other. So yeah. that's a, that's, that's a, a that's a part of this whole thing. It doesn't all yeah. need to be serious. It doesn't all need to be serious play. Although people like serious play, Seri you know, hard fun is good. Uh, Jane McGonigal has a whole riff on this that kids don't want to be like mollified. They want. She's got this sort of model. She and Nicole Lazaro also have this model of trying to bounce between oops too hard and what you just said about make it impossible is really interesting given this model. Right, because they're they're breaking through that boundary because you kind of want to solve it and go back uh, in order to bond with other people and uh, you know get to get to know and love the place. Mm -hmm. But but I think yeah, I, we need we need some kind of place online that we can get to know and love one another. And I, I think mm -hmm. that's a huge design challenge. It, it's mm -hmm. it's you know way harder than what you just described the Sky Team going through to figure out their one game. Yeah. Because yeah, making making true. things simple, the way you phrased it earlier, is hard. It's really, really hard to make it easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna look for the, the speech they did where they went through all the details and send it to you. Um I think it we can learn some things from game design. Sounds awesome. Yeah. Um wow. thanks. Thanks, so, Terry. should we wrap this call? Yeah, let's do that. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you too. Thanks, Jerry. Bye-bye. More soon. Bye.